So um, this is the weekly CSIG uh, series of talks on Thursdays at 10.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern. I'd like to hand over to Yassi to explain the series of talks. Yassi, over to you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Hi, I'm Yassi Mogadam. I'm the Executive Director of International Society of Service Innovation Professionals. We are a sponsor of these series. Um, uh, and um, uh, among other things, uh, uh, cognitive computing is uh, an enabler of Here, service innovation. Shows. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, are enablers of uh, uh, service innovation. And uh, so um, I invite you actually to join us with uh, and, and uh, learn more about uh, similar activities that we have uh, in ISEP at ISEP.org. Uh, so I'll hand it over uh, to our uh, esteemed speaker. Right. Thank you very much. Um, let me find my screen. Second. Oops. Are you able to see my slides? It's beautiful. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so. My name is Mina Chetinkara Rondell, and I will talk a little bit about first who I am and to give you a little bit of context of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so I wear a lot of hats, but two of them are I am a faculty member at the Department of Statistics at Duke University. And um, I, in terms of my uh, teaching, I, fo I focus mostly on statistics education uh, with an emphasis lately on data science education as well and teaching statistical computing as early as possible to students. That's kind of my goal, to uh, bring down computing education as early as possible in the curriculum, which as a statistician, I'll be the first to admit that we haven't necessarily done a great job in the stats discipline for teaching computing early on and doing so to big crowds. Um, we've kind of, in the past, um, statistics curricula have been designed in a way where computing comes later as an advanced topic, um, which it can be advanced, but I think it doesn't have to be. Um, and also another hat I wear is I am a data scientist and a professional educator at our studio. So the work I do there is mostly um, creating educational resources for um, learning and teaching R. Uh, some of these resources are used in in-person settings, um, but some of them are stuff that we put on our kind of the docs where the packages our studio uh, develops and also uh, we run workshops and stuff like that. So I work with undergraduate students mostly at Duke, but I also work with um, professionals at all levels um, in terms of my interactions through my our studio part of life. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is imagine that we have this goal, which I assume, uh, you know, many of the people who are in this call or might be interested in this um, have this idea that we are educating a new generation of data scientists where one of the things we might be wanting them to work on is machine learning and AI problems. And I think it's very important that we educate these um, new generation of scientists in a way that they're not intimidated by learning new computing technologies. I'm going to be talking uh, and giving examples based off of the way I teach nowadays, which is modern and current for today, but I would be the first to acknowledge that I genuinely have no assurance that a first year undergraduate student I'm teaching today, by the time they graduate, the state of the art uh, tools and technologies we've taught them are going to be around. Things are changing pretty quickly. We want to be teaching our students the best of the best today. Um, maybe I can assure that's going to be relevant by the time they get a summer internship, but I don't think I'm in a place to assure that that's going, they're going to be, the toolkit itself will remain the same four years down the line. Um, so I think it's important to teach them in a way where they're not intimidated and willing to branch out and learn more on their own as well. So the question I want to try to answer is where do we start? And this might be a question um, that many of you have not necessarily thought about in the recent past. I'm 
I'm assuming, or based off of what I've seen on the chat, we don't necessarily have undergraduate students joining this. So think back to when you first started learning um, things that may or may not be relevant to what you were doing today, but may have somehow shaped what you're doing today. And in terms of where do we start, I want to kind of think about um, three questions. How early do we want to start? How long? do we have to teach them this material and how inclusive do we want to be um, i think these are going to be important for framing what i'm talking about because the talk isn't about an entire undergraduate curriculum that would be impossible to fit in 20 30 minutes but we're going to be talking about a specific course that could be an introductory course for data science uh, so in terms of how early as early as possible. And what that means in term in an educational setting, especially at the undergraduate level, is we're not assuming many prerequisites from students. So if you start adding on things like, well, I want to teach X, but for that my students need to know linear algebra, you've in a, you're inevitably pushing the bar in terms of when they can get started. So the goal is to develop a curriculum that will help us make the first steps toward that goal uh, I mentioned, but being able to do so perhaps in the first semester the students come to uh, their um, university. How long do we have? The particular course I'm talking about is one that you could teach in 10 to 15 weeks. Uh, we have 15 weeks here at Duke uh, for our semesters. Um, I think there are modifications that can be done to this that could be taught in more of a quarter setting um, in 10 weeks. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is a lot of these um, principles that I'll be talking about apply to other uh, media for delivery as well. So for example, I'm involved with teaching MOOCs and I can very easily imagine repurposing this type of content into that. Um, but we want to keep in mind that this is not just like a three week module that we're talking about. It would need to be break, broken up into perhaps a sequence of modules if that was the uh, medium of delivery. And how inclusive do we want to be? What do you mean how inclusive? Yes, we want to be inclusive. And there are many ways one can think about being inclusive. For this particular um, talk, I want to focus on this idea of being able to let anybody into this class and giving, designing a course where they can succeed in, regardless of the background they're coming in with. So we have students at an undergraduate institution who will be coming in with um, high levels of math, for example, just based off of uh, what what their high school education was like. They might have had exposure to computing. Uh, they might have had a very strong computer science class as part of their high school. If we have a curriculum that depends on that, that is inevitably not a very inclusive cur curriculum because you cannot assume everybody is coming in with that. So the idea is to design a curriculum for an introductory course where students coming in from um, with strong background in quantitative and computing skills can thrive and still learn, but also those who are not coming in with that do not feel completely lost in the curriculum. So where do we start? Um, so I'm going to do this in a way that I would actually present a case study in class as well, and I want to give you three options and well, kind of give you the punchline. The third option is where we're kind of getting to as like might be a good place to get started. So I have a very simple data set that I will show. Um, this is on teacher salaries. It's an old data set from the 90s, but it, it makes the point and I don't think like the numbers, the values themselves aren't necessarily what's important here. We have data on 50 states. And what we know are three things about these states. Uh, one of them is the estimated average annual salary of teachers in public elementary and secondary schools. Another thing we know is the average uh, total SAT score of the students in that state. And we also know the percentage of all eligible students taking the SATs. Um, one of the things that is of interest to our students a lot, and I get a lot of questions about this, um, and I think it's a very, very important topic, is uh, prediction. So that would be one option. And to kind of like set the stage, I teach with R. And there's a certain kind of like suite of packages that we use. We use the Tidyverse suite of packages. So I'm kind of putting these out there as this is kind of the R code that I'll show along the way, which is what the students see is kind of relying on these packages. Um, so Mosaic data is where I got the data set from. And Tidyverse and Broom packages are what I'm using for data visualization and modeling as well. Okay, so first option is start by teaching them prediction easy enough to do in R, something like this. I could fit a model uh, predicting uh, 
SAT scores from salaries of the um, teachers. And then f say, for example, if I was, if we were to say, let's raise the, raise the average salary to 40K or something like that for our students, what would we expect our um, average SAT score for the state to be? This is, this would be in terms of a teaching thing, this would be easy to get across to the students, but it's actually missing one very important point. We've fit a model and we've done a prediction without even looking at the data. And if I was to look at the data, this is what things look like. I can see that as salaries increase, the SAT scores go down. So that's like, what is happening here? And if I don't do this visualization ahead of time, at no point in my modeling or in this predictive um, workflow that I have, am I going to catch this? So this should be something that is curiosity inducing and actually should make us want to like stop and think, what exactly is happening in the underlying data? Option two is clustering. Uh, that's another thing that's easy to run and might be informative in some way. So we could run uh, something like a k-means cluster here and actually visualize the data as well. So we can see that there's maybe different things happening in different states. So each of these points represent a state. Um, and we're seeing these clusters based off of the average SAT score. But again, for at least one of the clusters, I'm seeing a negative, slightly negative slope for, um, so as the salary is increasing, the average SAT score is decreasing again. And the other thing is, I think this idea of like finding clusters in your data and looking at them visually can, can be like a nice finding for students, but we have developed no intuition as to what is driving these clusters right now. So again, we haven't really given students yet um, what might be the driving factor behind these. So what I would suggest is actually when we're um, kind of educating students um, and kind of building our way up to modeling, let's start with exploring the data. And um, that's why in the title of the talk, that data was bolded. So it's not just data science as a, um, as a discipline I'm talking about, but actually getting students to hands-on work with data as much as possible. So we might take a look at a scatter plot of these data. We can kind of see that downward slope, but something that students might be willing to do at this point or that we want to push them to do is think about this third variable we had in the mix, the percentage of um, students taking the SATs um, in this particular data set. And we're seeing the colors change as we go down the scatter plot. So the lower the percentage of students taking the SATs, the higher the average scores are. And as we go down to higher proportions of students taking the SATs, we're seeing a lot more variability in the salaries and lower average SAT scores. So this is something where students are going to start thinking about, huh, it's, there's obviously a third variable in effect here. I wonder what effect it has. So we can kind of see these three blobs happening. We can then think about categorizing these data based off of the, um, the percentage of SAT takers. And now we're actually starting to see this positive slope. So there seems to be a negative relationship between the fraction taking the SAT and the SAT scores. But once we account for that, we are seeing a positive, what I hope would be what we would expect, positive relationship between salaries and, salaries and average SAT scores. This doesn't mean increase your teacher salaries to bump up your SAT score necessarily. We're not talking about a causal relationship here, and that's gonna be important to discuss with the students, but mostly what we're talking about is if you have more resources that you're paying your teachers more, and probably doing more for the students as well, potentially with the more resources that you have, it is possible then that the average uh, performance on the SATs is higher for the students. So this exploratory pro process, I think, is a lot more informative for students, especially when they're first getting started. And as you can see, we were able to tell all of this story simply looking at visualizations. So my um, pitch here is that when we are teaching students coming in with no computing background, um, and we want them to get better at modeling down the line, we should still be starting with exploratory data analysis. Then we can go on to doing descriptive models where we actually do some interpretations based off of the models that we're building and then um, start thinking about prediction 
And then the world is your oyster. I mean, you can go anywhere from there, but I want to make sure that we build this like strong base of exploration and getting uh, actually inviting students to be curious about what might be other factors that would explain the relationships that they're seeing in the data that they're analyzing. So what does a semester long curriculum that's kind of based off of this ideology look like? Um, I would start with visualizing data. So fundamentals of data and data visualization. This is a great place to talk about things like confounding variables and Simpson's paradox that uh, we discussed here. And also it is a good way to start talking about programming period. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about why I think we should be teaching visualization as a way to teach programming in a little bit. But in this course, this is where we also teach like kind of the basics of the toolkit that the students are going to be using. So they're programming in R using R Studio. So this is where we teach them about that. They write reproducible reports using R Markdown. So this is where we teach them about that. And they also use uh, version control and GitHub um, for, for both version control and collaboration. And this is again a time that we spend a bunch of time building data visualizations, but do so slowly so that we can actually teach them essentials of the programming that they're going to need as well. Then we get into wrangling data, and these arrows are going back as well because we're not just like tidying data frames and building summaries for no reason. We're then visualizing again, trying to tell stories back and forth. Um, in this data wrangling process, we also um, talk to them about recoding and transforming variables that's gonna be useful when they get into modeling as well. And we also talk about getting data that doesn't just come, you know, serve to you on a silver platter, but actually going out and getting it yourself and talking about web scraping and iteration, you know, scraping data from over, uh, many, many web pages. And the reason why I like doing this early on is it actually feeds very nicely into when we get into inference and modeling. So the there is a hefty statistical component to such a course where we are building models visualizing inter interactions and doing prediction and model validation. And we're also doing inference, st statistical inference, but via simulation. So students are learning to do things like bootstrapping and randomization, as opposed to um, theorem-based methods. And the reason for that is, again, these students are coming in with no assumed statistical theory background, no probability background, um, no kind of like things like maximum likelihoods or whatnot that you would see before perhaps you're building up the intuition for something like statistical inference. So in order to make sure that we can still uh, touch on these important topics that hopefully will make them want to learn more, we're doing it from a computational perspective. And by the time we're doing bootstrapping and iterations, they've already seen it once when they were web scraping, which to me is an a lot simpler task in terms of there's some data on the web, I wanna get it onto my computer, as opposed to let me try to understand what a sampling distribution is. And then we usually have a few weeks at the end of the class where um, we touch on topics that we maybe don't get a chance to go into a huge amount of depth on, but the idea is that it's stuff that they might be interested in learning more about later. And this is when students are kind of on the side working on their projects. One of the really important things we talk about here is ethics. So I'll say a little bit more about visualization and a little bit more ethics um, before we end the call. But uh, we also do things like interactive visualizations, text analysis, we do a little bit of Bayesian inference. Really, that's like, whatever the instructor wants to do during those two weeks that would be hopefully motivating students to want to take that next course. So let's focus a little bit on the beginning and the end points. Why do we start with visualization? And I'll give three reasons for that. One of them is that, first of all, it's more likely for students to have intuition for interpretations coming in. Interpreting a model requires a lot of instructions beforehand. Interpreting a visualization um, is, I think, a lot easier on the students. Not that visualization interpretation is an easy topic, but it's easier for them to perhaps work through it on their own or in teams without additional instructions from the professor. Um, it's also easier for them to catch their own mistakes. It's really hard to build a model, take a look at results, and be able to say, hmm, those numbers look a little bit fishy. I think that requires years and years of experience versus 
when you make a mistake in your visualization and your lines are looking wonky, it's a bit easier for you to catch yourself. Um, and also, I think it's a great way to introduce programming. And remember, one of the goals was um, to educate these students who are computationally able and not scared. So I'll give you a very brief overview of how we would actually use um, visualizations to teach programming. So. Uh, we do visualizations using ggplot2 in this class, so we would actually build the visualization they've seen earlier kind of step by step. First, we lay out our canvas where we're going to be painting our data on, and then we actually add our data. So now we're, we can actually talk about our axes that we're going to be plotting our data on. And this is a great time to actually stop for a second and do a little bit of just-in-time teaching about how R works. So we're not starting with vectors and matrices and arrays to teach R. We're starting with a visualization. By this time, they've already seen that endpoint. We've already told them that story, so we're now building back up to that step-by-step. -step. So we can talk about how functions work in R, how arguments get supplied uh, to functions in R. So we're doing a little bit of just-in-time teaching but actually teaching them programming. Then we actually add our data onto our visualization. Um, so again, this gets us to talk a little bit about what a data frame is, which is an important data structure. But instead of having a lesson on data structures, we're bringing this um, notion in at the time when we're actually visualizing these data. So we talk about things like rows and columns and what a tidy data frame is. And then we keep building one by one. We, um, you know, drawing a line through a scatter plot is something most students have done in, um, in probably high school. So we can, again, kind of build off of these step by step and teach them a little bit of the programming syntax. We, we're then uh, kind of fast, uh, separating our data into the different um, fractions for the SAT uh, takers in these states adding a little bit of styling to our plot, and voila, this is where we were a few minutes ago. So if they have already told them the story, and they know what the end visualization they're building up to is, this building onto it step by step becomes a lot easier because hopefully you're losing at least fewer of them along the way because they kind of know where they're going with it. So that's at the beginning, this idea of starting with visualization for the purposes of, um, kind of getting them to think more about exploring the data, even if it may not lead somewhere, just to plot it and take a look at what might be going on in there, and also using it as a medium for teaching programming to students with no programming background. Coming to the later end of the class, we talked a little bit about ethics. So why touch on ethics, and also how to do this in such a course? One of the reasons to do so is to empower and warn at the same time. We're teaching students a lot of things they can do, but we also, I think at this point, want to be teaching them what are the things they may not want to do, or what are things they might read about that people have done with tooling similar to they've learned um, that they maybe should not have done. Um, oftentimes, this idea of ethics tends to come at the end of a curriculum as opposed to an end of a class where students learn a bunch of stuff and maybe in a capstone course it gets touched on. And I think it's really important to mention it early on as well. So they're going through the rest of their undergraduate curriculum having had these ideas in mind. It also helps students think beyond what the course curriculum can offer, because oftentimes the case studies we bring here are ones that are a lot more advanced than what we're able to accomplish in the introductory course. And I really like doing so using case studies that they can relate to based on the course curriculum. So I could, you know, we can think about many, many case studies of like uh, data science ethics breaches, but some of them may rely on them understanding something a lot more complicated than what they've learned about in class, and I think that makes it hard for them to connect with. So I'll give you two very brief examples. One of them is an article from 2016 from ProPublica um, on this um, kind of uh, predicting future criminals. And the nice thing here is we're talking about conditional probabilities, what we've done before. They're talking about prediction, another thing they've done in class before, and actually the data comes available so they can actually play around with it. And another example we give is this uh, blog post by Thomas Lumley about how to write a racist AI in R without really trying. And here the concepts are training a model, which is something they've learned, sentiment analysis, which is something we've touched on, and the implementation is in R so they can actually read through it.
So if you're thinking, fine, I'm intrigued, but I need to see the big picture, I have kind of the entire course content and curriculum here at datasciencebox.org. So I would encourage you to take a look at it if you are in education or if you know others in education who might be interested in it. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you so much, Mina. That was fabulous. There is a question in the chat from Scott. I don't know whether you want to unmute yourself, Scott, or shall I read it as you wish? Hi, Mina. Thank you so much. Uh, Hi. I'm curious uh, how brainstorming wise um, you would teach this data approach to, to, to statistics in Turkish similarly and differently to English. Um, where MIT OpenCourseWare is in Turkish, and I'm developing an MIT OpenCourseWare-centric online wiki-free university. Uh, how does your thinking about teaching data in Turkish change your theorizing of this as you've done it in English? Uh, oh, that's a very good question, and one I should be better equipped to answer given Turkish is my native language. But, you know, I've never actually taught in Turkish, if you can believe it. Um, I think one of the things that I would say, maybe the closest experience I have to this is um, the MOOC experience that I have where, I mean, we think we have diverse students at our institutions in the US, but when you literally teach it to the world, you really see the differences in how people perceive things. And I think one of the most important things would be to change up the data, the case studies that we bring in so they're actually relevant to the students. So I don't think it, in terms of thinking about the programming aspect, I wouldn't necessarily change much. Um, but in terms of the data that we're working with, I think it's crucial, especially early on, to find data sets that we think might be relevant to students that they actually might have some intuition about is the important thing to drive this exploration process. Very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is, I have a, a quick follow-up, Mina. Does, yeah. Is there any difference when you teach a, a, through a MOOC versus teaching in person? Is it pretty much the same? Um, well, I think there is a difference. So some of the things that is, um, I think the biggest difference is you're not physically in the classroom with these students. So from an instructional perspective, there is much little room for error there because you could be confusing people and you don't have a second to say, hey everyone, I there's a typo here, let's go back and review that. So you don't get that. But one other thing you don't get necessarily is, um, you know, in the classroom, even if students are working with each other, they're doing so in a controlled environment versus on a MOOC on the discussion forums, the, I mean, the, the, a question gets asked and the answer that's given could be way off from that and you would never know um, as the instructor. So I think it requires a lot more organization. It requires um, a lot more of the communicating of expectations of the course to the students in a way we don't think about as much at a university setting, I think, because we just assume people would come and ask us. But I have to say that teaching the MOOC and then redesigning it again to make it a little bit better for this big audience, I think has actually made me a lot better educator here at the university as well, because I realized all the little organization things I could get away with not doing, but if I do them, it, the result is a lot better. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and Scott has followed up with the Khan Academy um, reference. Thank you. Any, any other questions, anybody? Oh, we have, can you measure student progress by number and kind of questions students ask? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I think that the students asking questions thing is an interesting uh, thing. I think perhaps it's a little bit easier to do such a thing where you are maybe on an online environment where students would be asking you the questions more often. One of the things I um, observe in a classroom setting where students get to like know each other personally is a lot of the questions initially they will ask each other. And I think that's great. I think that's great for their learning, but I think it makes it a bit harder for me to measure their progress versus if they had to always ask the professor in a way that could be recorded, I think that would be an interesting thing to study. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Oh, and how would you differentiate between data science and data analytics? 
Um, I don't know how I would differentiate between them. Um, I think, I think one of the things that potentially one could be referring to when you're thinking about data analytics, I may not be right on this, but this is kind of like my thinking about it is I think data analytics, I, I think of there is a given data set for you that's kind of like ready to analyze. And then maybe the steps are the same under both disciplines. But may, I think of data science a little bit more as maybe the data set that you need to answer a particular question isn't even like just given to you yet. So you need to first formulate what is the type of data I need to collect? Where can I get it? How can I do so in a computationally efficient way? And then go ahead and do the analysis. That's one potential way I can think of. Although I have to say, I think I've seen the terms used interchangeably in the sense that different disciplines tend to use different words, but sometimes to describe the same job that one is doing. I suspect some of the people on this call have uh, an opinion. Why don't you write in the chat if you, you know, if you know of a difference? And please also thank Mina for her talk in the chat. And yeah, it would be good to hear the difference if you have an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to see that. Any any further questions? Okay. Ooh, nice nice feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just waiting to see if there's any more. Um, and uh, how many hours teaching do you do, uh, like per week typically, Mina? Do you do like um, ten hours, three hours? Well, so I'm in the classroom. The course that I'm describing here. Uh, meets three times, twice with me, uh, one and a, a 75 minutes each, and then one with a, a TA for like a lab component. Um, so that's the interaction, like the face-to-face -face interaction that we have. But from like all of the work that goes into from the student's perspective, we're expecting about 10 hours of work a week, a week okay. from the students. Mm -hmm. Great, great. That's yeah. uh... And I probably spend like 25 putting it together. Putting it together, <laughs> yes, of course. But your, the impact of your 25 hours is... Yeah, yeah. Yes. And somebody's put a clever answer about the difference between data analytics and data science. It's a hundred K dollars a year difference. Yeah. <laughs> job title. <laughs> if you... It's possible, yeah. Mina, I have two more little questions. Thank sure. you again. Um, one has to do with the question of engagement, face-to-face uh, -face in the classroom versus face-to-face -face online. Um, how one could leverage online resources, text chat and uh, video face-to-face -face, um, for mm -hmm. more engagement when one might lose engagement online um, over face-to-face uh, -face in classroom. And the other question has to do with, are you thinking at all in terms of um, the uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, sorry, the MIT MIT drag and drop programming language Scratch and even oh. home robotics in terms of teaching data science. So Lego Mindstorms with Scratch 3 um, right. into data science and, and uh, statistics. Is that uh, on the horizon at all? Yeah. So, so let me answer the two questions. In terms of the engagement, I mean, I think the engagement aspect is difficult in an online course. But one of the things that is nice about it is when you have students in a classroom, and you're saying, okay, now we're doing some activity. Now you're actually going to be doing things. Everyone kind of has to do it, um, whether they want to or not. One of the nice things I've, I've observed with online teaching is if you have a interactive component, inevitably it ends up needing to be, I think, um, optional. And those who do so are people who are opting in to do so. And so the level of engagement from these people that you, that actually opt in to do the interactive part or do the in-person office hours, online type of thing, or actually use the discussion forums, I think the level actually, level actually is a lot higher because they really want to be doing it. So the, the personal drive, I think, is a big contributor to success in the engagement aspect of things. So I wish we can, you know, the goal, is not to make students have to do something interactively, but instead like almost want them to do it. So one way that I try to drive that in the classroom is 
giving them assignments and projects where they recognize the sum of the parts is going to be bigger than their individual work. If they can see that, I think they're willing to collaborate and interact a bit more. Um, in terms of the Scratch as a language, I'm very intrigued by this idea, to be honest. And then on the other hand, what I'm what I always think about is, especially at the college level, I feel like we want to be teaching students the tool that will grow with them. So like they can take through the entire curriculum. Um, in my mind, I wouldn't say Scratch necessarily falls in the same bucket as like some of the GUI, like intro stat software that's developed. I realize they're different, but I do wonder if there is like, as we think about asking people to leave the software that's developed only for introductory education for things that will grow with them, where do things like Scratch lay? Um, I'm not 100% sure at the college level. I feel like they could be just writing, like programming at that level. But what about high school? I mean, there's so much more statistics right now happening in high school. Is there a way we can drive more of that there or even early on at instances where we couldn't necessarily assume pro teaching programming at scale is a good idea? So I haven't done any work in it, but I've read a little bit about it and I'm very, very intrigued. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, um, Scott, for your questions and thank you everyone for your feedback. There's a lot of differences between analytics and data science. We could do a statistical analysis. Of <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, and, and thank you so much, Mina. I know we've gone on a little longer than usual, but uh, thank you. Every, everyone was so engaged. And please thank Mina in the chat if you enjoyed the session. The recording will go up later today. Um, and wishing everybody a very happy holiday season. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 I'll just stay on a couple of more minutes just to see if anybody has any more points. Uh.